Okay, so good evening everyone to the second keynote speech of the virtual summit on resilient and regenerative food systems. Um, and we have a very uh, special speaker today with us, uh, Professor Rathan Lal, who's joining us. He's a distinguished pro um, university professor at Ohio State University and also the director at Carbon Management and Sequestration Center. And he recently got an award, which everyone heard his name for in the last few days, uh, which is the World Food Prize. And he will be talking to us a bit. Um, that be, um, as, uh, he'll be delivering a speech, but he'll be talking a bit before he does that. I'll ask a few questions and ask him to introduce himself and his work before he goes into the keynote presentation. Professor Lal, over to you now. Thank you. I will share the PowerPoint and uh, hopefully you can see it soon. Um, yes, Professor Lal, we can see it. Uh, okay. Would you mind giving a brief introduction about yourself before we start the presentation? Um, what you do and how all this connects? And then if you don't mind going to the presentation. Okay, I will uh, do that. I just want to make sure that you see the regenerative agriculture title slide. Yes, that's visible. Oh, good. All right. Well, um, I'm uh, originally from India. Uh, I studied at Ohio State for my PhD, and from here I went to Sydney, Australia for about a year uh, as a postdoc, and then for about 18 years in Africa with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, and then I came back to Ohio State as a professor, and I've been here for 33 years, and I teach uh, two classes. One is environmental soil physics, and the other is soil and climate. And um, we have um, uh, quite a few visiting scholars with us. Right now we have uh, uh, none actually. Uh, many of them who are expected, they are held back because of the COVID. And those who are with us, uh, I think we had a total of eight this year. Uh, they just left last week, two of them uh, just left. So hopefully we will have some opportunity to have some visiting scholars from Sri Lanka. I have visited there several times. I went to a um, couple of places, Mahailupalam, um, um, I remember I went to Jaffna. I attended a meeting in Colombo, uh, but that has been many years ago. I think I would say about 35 years ago. So with that, I'm going to begin with um, my talk, Regenerative Agriculture of Food and Climate Security. That was the one suggested by the organizers to whom I thank for giving the opportunity to talk to you. I want to go back to the concept of green revolution. And uh, between 61 and 2020, our global population increased by a factor of 2.5 from 3.1 billion to 7.8 billion now, uh, but the cereal grain production increased 3.3 times from 880 million tons to almost 3 billion tons at present. Therefore, the per capita cereal production increased by a factor of 32% from 284 kilogram per person per year to 378. And uh, this miracle that saved hundreds of millions of people from starvation uh, is appropriately can be called the Borlaug effect. Dr. Norman Borlaug, uh, along with Dr. Swaminathan and others who started the Green Revolution globally, but especially in South Asia. However, the Green Revolution was based on inputs of fertilizers the nitrogen fertilizer increased at the same time by a factor of almost 10. Phosphorus factor by five, potassium fertilizer also five. Pesticide was drastically increased. Uh, there were practically no pesticide used before 1960. So now quite a lot. Irrigation area globally went up from 144 to 350 million hectare. So there were a lot of inputs and uh, simultaneously, since 1750, 
the global warming has happened until 2017 by one degree centigrade. The rate of increase in temperature is at the rate of 0.2 degrees centigrade per decade. Uh, the land use, 75% of the Earth's land surface is altered by humans. 85% of the wetlands have been drained. 33% of all land is already degraded. Uh, we are expecting another 25 million kilometer of roads between now and 2050. So humans are changing uh, uh, nature tremendously. Um, the Green Revolution was a seed-centric technology, as I mentioned, uh, improved seeds of dwarf varieties of wheat, rice, and other crop. Dwarf because they're short-statured. That means they will not lodge with fertilizer input, specifically designed. Uh, and 90% of the world population uh, is being fed by those kind of uh, technology. Without Green Revolution, about 50% of the world people, that's almost 4 billion, may face a lack of food. Uh, the dependence on fossil fuel, however, has many environmental implications. We have emitted almost 440 gigaton of carbon uh, from fossil fuel since uh, 1750 and the total from land use change since 10,000 BCE because of agriculture is 555 gigaton. And that together uh, has caused the global warming. Uh, despite of all that, uh, one in 11 people, recent report 2020 by FAO, almost 690 million people food insecure and two to three billion people are affected by malnutrition. And COVID-19 is causing this problem even more serious. Therefore, the humanity is at a crossroad and faced with a challenge of how to reconcile the need for sustaining food production with the necessity of improving the environment and restoring degraded soils. Therefore, this meeting organized uh, is very timely is, uh, because that is a very serious issue. And that brings me to the subject of what is soil health. Soil health refers to the soil's capacity as a dynamic and biologically active entity within natural and managed landscape to sustain multiple ecosystem services, including net primary productivity, food and nutrition security, biodiversity, water purification, and renewability, carbon sequestration, air quality and atmospheric chemistry, and elemental cycling for two reasons, human well-being and nature conservation. Nature conservation is very important. If nature is destroyed, polluted, human are part of nature, human will also suffer the consequences. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is an example of when you degrade nature, what its implications can be to human. This is a very tragic situation, but that's exactly an example of that. Therefore, the future revolution, green revolution to feed people, must be soil-based so that the soil resilience is improved. It must be eco-based, eco-efficiency, how ecological efficiencies of nitrogen, phosphorus, fertilizer, irrigation energy is improved. It must be science-driven, knowledge-based. And we must think about putting all that 555 gigaton of carbon that was emitted from the beginning of agriculture to date, back into the nature, put back into trees, soil, wetland, and terrestrial biosphere, and part of wetland, which is hydrosphere, how to put it back. That brings us to the question of uh, what is this carbon pool that we want to put back? Soil carbon pool has two parts, organic and inorganic. Organic carbon pool could be live material, including fauna and flora, microbial biomass carbon, 
it could be undecomposed detritus material, leaf, litter, branches, trees, so forth. It could be decomposed. Decomposed can be protected. Humus material is protected within soil aggregates or soil formation of organominal complexes, or it may be unprotected, which means it's free as a dissolved organic carbon, particulate organic carbon, macro organic carbon. Then we have an inorganic carbon. There are two types of them. Uh, lithogenic, which is derived from rocks. That means calciferous rocks. They, when they decompose, when they weather, they release carbonates and bicarbonates. And it can be pedogenic. And pedogenic can be carbonates and bicarbonate. Pedogenic are formed by soil processes. For example, organic material, which is here, are the plant roots. They release CO2. This CO2 is uh, dissolved in water by irrigation or rainfall, and that becomes carbonic acid. This carbonic acid precipitates with calcium, magnesium, potassium. And if those cations are brought in from outside the land that you are talking about, through manuring, through fertilizers, through liming, through deposition by water or wind, and when that carbonate precipitates, it's secondary carbonates, and that is sequestration also. So carbon in soil sequestration can be organic or inorganic as pedogenic carbonates and bicarbonates. So soil management should be such that the fertility can be improved by practices other than fertilizer. And fertilizer can also be used and soil compaction does not have to happen. So we can minimize plowing, drought, so that conserve water in the root zone by preventing runoff and erosion and improving infiltration. And uh, acidity also improved by not adding chemical fertilizers, which causes a lot of nitrogen fertilizer increase acidification. So fertilizer, plowing, irrigation can be moderated, uh, reduced uh, by improving efficiency by better soil health which really means putting carbon in soils uh, to a level of about two and a half to three and a half percent of soil organic matter or one and a half to two percent of organic carbon. So if I were to plot a graph between crop yield and organic matter content, the optimum level is somewhere between two and a half to three and a half percent. Most soils of South Asia, upland soils, including Sri Lanka, have a organic matter content in the root zone, the top 20, 30 cent, only about 0.5%. I know some soil which have organic matter content of 0.1%. Therefore, their productive capacity of soil function is jeopardized, is hindered, it is limited. Therefore, we must put carbon back in soil. And the question arises, how can you put back? And the carbon in soil can be put back by process of management in which the input of biomass carbon, uh, such as by biochar, compost, cover cropping, root biomass crop residue, should exceed, be more than the losses of carbon by erosion, leaching, and decomposition. This will increase carbon in soil. If on the other hand, the input is less than the losses, we always have depletion of carbon. Unfortunately, most soils in South Asia are suffering from this condition where what we add is less than what we lose. Therefore, our soils are continuously depleting. We should do no-till farming with a cover crop, such as you see a rye cover crop, winter rye uh, suppressed and then planted corn through it. We can have a cover crop of legume Centrosthema, Puraria, Kurzu, Makuna, Pigeon Peas. Uh, there are many of those in the tropics. Uh, there are examples that we are showing you. So that when you manage soil fertility, the focus is not on NPK, but the focus is on CNPK. C is carbon, organic matter, which we can put in the soil so that the need for NPK chemical fertilizer will be less. Cover crops are a very important part of that, especially leguminous cover crops. So uh, 
that brings me to the question of what is regenerative agriculture, which is the thematic topic today. And regenerative agriculture, system-based regenerative agriculture, it reconciles the need of producing adequate and nutritious food with the necessity of restoring the environment and making farming a solution to environmental issue. Regenerative agriculture includes a wide range of farming and grazing practices aimed at restoration and sustainable management of soil health through sequestration of soil organic carbon. And I showed you what that was. There is no one techniques that can be used, adopted everywhere uh, because there are many soil types, but our, our A, regenerative agriculture includes system-based conservation agriculture, no-till farming, in conjunction with residue mulching, cover cropping, integrated nutrient and pest management, complex rotation, and integration of crops with trees and livestock. So uh, example include conservation agriculture. There's a whole list of those practices, integration of crops with trees and livestock. There are many practices, including agroforestry, lay farming, silvopasture, restoration of soil health, land degradation neutrality, wetland restoration, conservation reserve program, and of course, soil organic carbon sequestration, both inorganic and organic, and biomass carbon sequestration in trees and biomass. So all these are examples of regenerative agriculture. Agronomic yield uh, with this system is optimum. You are not thinking always of maximizing the yield, you are optimizing it over a long period of time. Chemicals are supplemental if needed. They are not the main thing. Resource use, the idea is to produce more from less, less land, less water, less energy. Global warming must be minimized uh, because now you are sequestering carbon and reducing gaseous emission. Profitability is optimum and sustained. It's not maximum one time, and then later on soil is degraded. Soil degradation must be reversed. Food quality is improved by nutrition sensitive agriculture and environment quality is improved. And however, farmers may require some incentives as payment for ecosystem services. And we really need some legislation that has a Soil Health Act similar to that in US, we have a Clean Air Act and we have a Clean Water Act. We need Soil Quality Act. So the system is continuous soil cover. Soil should never be left open. Do not disturb the soil. Follow integrated nutrient management, complex crop rotation, and restore soil organic carbon and produce more from less. So that is essentially what it is. If you want to look at a, a conceptual cartoonistic view, you have an improved plant a plant that can uh, emit molecular-based signal, which can be detected by remote sensing, plant which has a deep root system, a prolific root system, it is associated with mycorrhizal, uh, and we grow this plant with mulch cover all the time, with a cover crop all the time. We add soil organic matter through integration of crops with trees and livestock in such a way that soil organic matter content is two and a half to three and a half percent with very high soil biodiversity. Soil become disease suppressive. If supplemental nutrients are needed, they apply directly to plant roots through drip fertigation so that water and nutrients are directly absorbed by plant and not leaking into the environment. That is a conceptual basis of organic agriculture. If we can increase organic matter content of the soil carbon by one ton per hectare, the, the yield increase uh, for the same level of fertilizer and management, uh, irrigation, extra, corn will be 100 to 300 kilogram, soybean, wheat, rice, sorghum, millet, beans, cassava, yam, tropical root crop, same thing. So increasing carbon by 10 ton uh, in soil, uh, by regenerative agriculture can really enhance uh, food quality and quantity, uh, especially so in developing countries. 
The rates of carbon sequestration uh, in sub-Saharan Africa have been estimated half a ton of carbon per hectare per year. In the Indo-Gangetic plains have been estimated about 0.4 ton of carbon per hectare per year. In Brazil, about 0.4 tons per hectare. Also in Brazil, one and one and a half tons per hectare. Globally, several studies have shown about 0.6 kilogram of carbon per hectare per year. Technical potential of carbon sequestration, if we did all these things good, for all soils of the world can be as much as two and a half gigaton of carbon per year. If we did soil and vegetation, afforestation, everything together between now and 2100, over next 80 year period, we can put carbon 330 gigaton, about 157 parts per million of CO2. Remember what we had last time I gave you in the first slide was 555 gigaton. This is about half of that what we have lost. So a good practice can achieve that. So that is something worth aiming at. Uh, we have three options for how to promote that. One is preach people stewardship of natural resources. One is provide them economic incentive. The third is have some legal option. Briefly describe each one of them. Stewardship is a good thing. We tell people that stewardship and care must be embedded in every fruit and vegetable eaten, in each grain ground into the bread consumed, in every cup of water we drink, in every breath of air and hail, and in every scenic landscape cherished. That is the stewardship. We can encourage farmers to do that, but we can also pay them at the price of carbon sequestration and improving water quality, biodiversity. I have calculated that price depending upon those rates I showed you, 0.4 to 0.5, 0.6, uh, ton per carbon per hectare per year, that comes to about 40 to $60 per hectare per year payment for ecosystem services. That comes to about 16 to $20 per acre per year. That money can come from industry, from government, from NGOs, but it should be paid only if farmers adopt the practices we just talked about. The third is the legal possibility. Soil is a living entity. Therefore, like any other living entity, soil must also have rights. And the violator of right probably should not be given any incentive, but the one who promotes soil right should be given 40 to $60 per hectare. The idea is soil health is like three-legged stool. By adopting regenerative science-based package of practices that I just mentioned, uh, residue management, conservation agriculture, IPM, INM, uh, cover cropping, everything, with proper incentive and payment for ecosystem services, we can restore soil health. I think there is a last point I want to mention is uh, if I am asked a question, what would I suggest to make land management a solution to environment? the logical response would be to objectively and critically consider how do we take land resources for granted and use this as a property that has no rights. Property has no rights. Uh, it has only uh, what it can serve the master. We are part of nature. Nature doesn't belong to us. So soil, water, vegetation, we must respect as having its own right. Therefore, a prudent strategy would imply making land and agriculture an integral part of the solution and empowering farmers and land managers to restore degraded lands, efforts to denuded lands, and return much marginal land back to nature, give land back to nature. I know many organizations say we need more land, to feed people by 2050, I disagree. We already produce enough food. We waste one third of the food produced wastage. Any ton of food wastage saved is much better than food produced more. So save food, cherish it, 
and land must be returned back to nature. It would be impossible to keep the global temperature at safe level unless radical transformation of the maize in way the which human produce and consume the food and manage the earth's finite and fragile land resources. The COVID-19 pandemic has created urgency about the need of strengthening local food production sources, which are more resilient and are based on recycling bio-waste and gray black water, the city water, and they also involve soil-less solutions, aquaculture, aeroponics, hydroponics, artificial soil. So colleagues and friends, that is the message I would like to leave with you. And Dr. Vijay Nayake, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk. I'll be glad to answer any question you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lal. Um, and I'm not Dr. Vijay Nayake, I'm just Ms. Vijay Nayake. I don't have a doctorate. Okay. Um, yes. Um, so I have a few questions, but we do have a lot of participants waiting as well, I presume. So I would okay. like to request those who have questions to please type it in the chat box, which I would pick and um, read out for Professor Lal, which might be easier, I suppose. Uh, but while we wait for those questions, um, my first question to you would be, so you, you gave a lot of information on how we can do um, these food practices in agriculture. Um, so when you're optimizing the crop production and the um, utility of soil or making use of soil uh, in the way that you proposed, um, how long are we looking at to have good results? Because usually when we talk about organic agriculture or pr any practice that's climate friendly, there's an argument that it might have repercussions on food security. So how would we say this is not the case and that this is the timeline potentially that uh, we could look at to have good results? Now, first, let me say, I had a very good friend and a colleague. We used to work together in Nigeria. His name was Dr. Ray Vijay Vardhane. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. He was also the chancellor at uh, University of, um, um, I think, um, at now Maharlu Palam, but uh, Kandy, University in Kandy. And uh, Mr. Vijay Vardhane, was, uh, I think, cousin of President Jay Vardhane. Uh, I knew the family very well. And he was an engineer who designed a lot of equipment uh, to implement what I'm just talking about. So uh, your question was, how long it does it take when you shift from conventional agriculture to no-till regenerative agriculture? Initial two, three year transition, crop yield can be lower. Uh, unless a cover crop is grown right from the beginning. And uh, once the soil organic matter content is improved by cover cropping and by agroforestry and other practices, uh, then the dependence on chemical, I'm not saying there'll be no chemical at all. I think chemicals are used as supplemental and that um, um, reduction in chemical use will become obvious in three, five years and from there on, uh, soil should not need any disturbance uh, as long as the ground is always covered. So three to five year initially transition period and subsequently, uh, if the question was how long can the carbon sequestration continue? It depends on how degraded the soil is. If the soil had lost 75% of its original organic carbon, it may take 50, 60 years before the entire carbon is filled. We have experimented at Worcester, Ohio, where our experiments have been going on since 1960. Uh, our carbon concentration, though soil is now about 90% of what is in a forest area nearby. It's a slow process. Uh, from five to 25, 30 year, the rate of carbon sequestration may be high and subsequently uh, it kind of tapers off. So it follows a sigma, typical sigma curve. Okay. Thank you, but, Professor Lal. Uh, you should look up the publications from Dr. Ray Vijay Vardhane and also Dr. Chris Panaboke. 
Thank These you. These were two soil scientist colleagues that I worked with from Sri Lanka, and they were both very high class uh, uh, scientists, uh, uh, as good as anywhere in the world. So look for their publication by Mr. Vijay Vardhane and uh, Mr. Chris Panaboke. Thank you. And my colleague says, um, Prof. Uh, Prof. Tavi Vijay Vardhane is from University of Moroto, if I'm not mistaken, uh, close to Colombo, if I'm not mistaken. So we have heard the name and thank you for reminding us of his work. So we will look into what he's done, uh, most likely for examples to things that we can do in Sri Lanka. Um, so I have a question that has been shared with me privately. A um, lot of people would like to hear about the World Food Price you got recently. Would you like to share a few information on what it was about and for the work that was specifically focused? I'm very fortunate and privileged to receive the World Food Prize. Um, it it's a great, great honor indeed. Uh, I'm number 50th who received uh, the, so far the World Food Prizes. I think I'm a third soil scientist who have received the World Food Prize. The first World Food Prize was given to Dr. Swaminathan, who is not too far from where you are. He's based in Chennai. Uh, in fact, I received a video clipping from him uh, today, uh, him and his daughter. Um, so. I am very fortunate that I'm in um, a list of colleagues uh, who are very high level. Um, so it's a matter of great luck for me that I'm part of the same group of people. Uh, the World Food Prize, uh, similar to the money I received uh, for Japan Prize and other, I donated the money to do research on soil and water. The World Food Prize money will also be donated to continue doing the research on soil and um, uh, education and research both globally. Uh, how exactly it will happen, I do not know yet, uh, but all I know is that it will be donated for the good of the cause. And if anybody else wish to donate to the endowment that we have created, they are most welcome to, but uh, I will certainly donate uh, the money that I did last year, about $550,000. Uh, I will donate also this and create uh, as some kind of foundation in which this money will be used for research and education globally. Thank you, Professor. Um, that was very motivating to hear that you're actually going to give the whole price for betterment of the work that you're focusing on. Um, so a question on uh, back to the thematic focus and the content of what you presented. Um, so there's a question about challenges that we face. What would you call the key challenges to ensuring regenerative agriculture could happen in developing countries? Oh yeah, this is an important part. Right now, globally speaking, we have 1500 million hectare of agricultural land out of which only 180 million hectare, that's about 12, 15% is under this kind of agriculture that I just explained. Why people are not using it? I mentioned leave the crop residue on the land. I mentioned uh, grow cover crops. These things require resources. And uh, poor farmers who cultivate five acres, 10 acres, uh, two acres, they do not always have those resources. That is why I mentioned payment to farmer for ecosystem services on the basis of uh, rate of carbon sequestration. So that is one part. Second, I mentioned Mr. Vijay Vardhane from uh, Sri Lanka, and he was uh, an engineer designing seeding equipment. If you do not plow the land, you have to have a special drill, a drill which can be either manually operated or pulled by a small tractor uh, or pulled by an animal uh, so that it can plant in a land which has a lot of mulch on the ground and it's not plowed. So that kind of equipment is also not available. Uh, in North India, Punjab, uh, Haryana, they have a seed drill called Happy Seeder, uh, which is pulled by a tractor. Uh, unfortunately, they burn crop residue. I was very sad to read a newspaper yesterday that they have started burning the residues of rice right now. And uh, which means the happy seeder cannot cut through the residue, otherwise why should they be burning it? 
So this no-till cedar has to be heavy enough to cut through the residue. And Mr. Vijay Vardhane was designing those kind of equipment. So when I, this morning I was preparing the PowerPoint, I remembered him and uh, how good a work he was doing. So those are some of the limitations. Um, availability of the seeding equipment, availability of the resources to leave the residue in the land rather than taking it away, uh, availability of the land for a time at which a cover crop should be grown so that the soil quality nutrient level is improved. Those are the constraints which have to come through providing incentive to the farmers. And then of course, the awareness that this is the kind of agriculture we need. Thank you, Professor La. Uh, there's another question, um, which is about uh, plowing and weed management. So one of the participants would like to know your opinion about it. Um, do you have any? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, weed management is a very important question. Is a very good question indeed. And some of the weeds uh, which are in tropics like Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Malaysia, part of Africa, um, uh, what you call spear grass, alang alang, imprata cylindrica. Uh, and when plow, unfortunately, uh, immediately it looks like the ground has got rid of the weed, but because it propagates by rhizome, you know, it has a rhizome underground, and plowing will multiply those rhizome from one. Uh, cutting into maybe 10 cuttings. So once they germinate again, in place of one seed, one plant of weed, now we have 10 of them and they never stop. The best way to weed control is a cover crop. Uh, you can also control weeds by any ground cover. If this weed do not get light, uh, of course they cannot survive. So there are some cover crops I used to grow mukuna utilis, velvet beans. It's not as edible as uh, some of the other beans that uh, we are used to eating in South Asia, but uh, velvet bean is also edible. But velvet bean produces biomass quite a lot, like 20, 25 tons of uh, fresh biomass per hectare over a short period of three to four months. And it completely covers the ground. And as a result, uh, it uh, smothers all the weeds. And then uh, it dies naturally. And then you can seed through it like you are seeding through a dead sod. The only problem is if the seeds were not picked up, if the seed of Makuna were not picked up, they will germinate and then they can climb on the car or, or any other crop that you planted through it. So it is very important that the pods of the seed are picked up before they shatter. And then this is a very good way to do. I had also a, a Ray Vijay Vardhane, he used to take a pride in growing a trifolium, a, a very low growing legume like Arachis prostrata. Um, it's a, only about maybe two inch high, it never climbs, it doesn't uh, uh, become a twiner. It's very low growing. And all you had to do, all Ray was doing was opening a small strip, maybe two inch wide through that green and then grow corn through it and there's no competition at all this will be a green bed you have replaced a low growing legume whose root system uh, is in a very shallow uh, corn and beans and coffees and cassava would have a deeper root system uh, Ray was very good at these kind of things so I would very much encourage you to look into some of his pictures and publication uh, at Candy, where he was a uh, vice chancellor, maybe he has left uh, some of those things there. But uh, weed can be controlled by biological means, by chemical means, and mechanical means. I am recommending biological means, cover crops, mulch. Plastic sometimes is used if you have a biodegradable plastic. Please remember I said biodegradable. The plastic that does not degrade should not be used. That's a pollution. If there is a biodegradable film that can uh, cut out the light to the weeds, that's another option. Gravel mulch. If you go to an arid region of uh, Sri Lanka, uh, where rainfall is less than 500 millimeter, people use gravel mulch. In Israel, in China, in China I have seen miles after miles, 300 millimeter rainfall area, 
covered by gravel mulch, no weeds, water, no erosion. Uh, you can grow corn, soybeans, uh, you can grow uh, uh, sunflower, melon, melon definitely throw on gravel mulch, do very good. So where there's a way, there's a will. Weeds can be controlled. Okay, thank you, Professor Lal. Um, next question is about Fakuoka farming methods and zero budget natural farming. Do you have anything that you would like to share about this? Please, please repeat that question. Zero carbon budget farming? Uh, well, I'm reading uh, what Pradeep has asked. Um, he's asking about zero budget natural farming and Fakuaka farming methods. These are new to me, so I'm hoping you would be able to. Well, the, I would like to know zero budget. Is there a zero money budget or is there a zero carbon budget? Uh, so I know uh, we are talking about farming which is a low carbon budget farming. That means the carbon emissions from fertilizer, pesticide, tillage becomes less. There's another farming called uh, uh, negative emission technology where uh, emission of methane and nitrous oxide is less. So the question is a little bit incomplete, uh, but yes, low carbon emission uh, agriculture, low, low uh, carbon input agriculture, uh, carbon positive agriculture, that means carbon is going into the soil and uh, vegetation. Uh, that is the agriculture that I just described. Uh, you remember there was a balance, a picture, and I was saying how to sequester carbon, creating a positive carbon budget. So that is the, uh, we are also calling uh, uh, emission neutral agriculture. That means whatever emissions are happening through plowing or through fertilizer, they are neutralized by offset through carbon sequestration. Uh, so there are many terminology, but the question is not very explicit. Uh, when you talk about budget, please be specific. Are you talking about carbon budget? Now we must produce food. So food is a carbon, we are gonna take it out uh, so unless we harvest food, we can't uh, eat food. So the question is, how can we add carbon in soil and biomass back on the land from where we harvested food? So it become a zero carbon uh, budget uh, operation. That is called carbon neutral agriculture. So that's really all I can address from the information that was provided. Thank you, uh, Professor Lal. Um, so this question is from Dennis. Uh, he thanks you, uh, thanks you for the presentation, uh, which was very insightful. And he's asking whether there's any experience on the uptake of the practices you presented. And um, you also mentioned about uh, incentivizing the process by paying farmers. So has this been adopted by in, anyone in the world? Um, and are policies and regulatory interventions required to facilitate large scale change. So that's three parts of the question. Yes, I, uh, yes, uh, you know, the, this technology I'm talking about is not uh, from uh, new from today. I mentioned Ray Vijay Vardhan and I were working in Africa in 1970s. And uh, that is when I also came to Sri Lanka. I stayed at a home very close to where the president of Sri Lanka at that time was staying. Uh, Mr. Jay Vardhane. Um, so uh, Ray was very much promoting this kind of agriculture uh, at Mahailupalam, uh, at uh, Kandy, at many other places throughout uh, in the semi-arid region, uh, dry part of Sri Lanka and the humid part as well. So uh, the question really is uh, whether farmers should be paid uh, to adopt it on a more uh, permanent basis. And, uh, and if anybody else is paying. Uh, in the US, there are some companies who have started paying farmers. There's a company called Indigo. And uh, my guess is Indigo is paying uh, $10 per ton of CO2. Remember I was saying the price should be 35 to $40 per ton of CO2. Uh, that is the way I calculated as a societal value of uh, carbon. Uh, in Europe, the price of carbon uh, dioxide is 25 euro per ton of CO2. 
So euro is about 1.1, 1.2 dollar. So 25 euro is about 30 dollar. Uh, so that is very close uh, to compare to what I'm talking. Uh, I think India has been talking about giving farmers about 1200 rupees uh, a acre per year. I don't think they have started it, but I did discuss this with the ICR, Indian Council of Agriculture Research. And uh, they have uh, some kind of document. Uh, they are proposing this. Uh, I had a potentially meeting proposed with ministers of agriculture of Haryana, Punjab, Delhi, Rajasthan, UP. Uh, it has not happened. Uh, but uh, the idea was to discourage farmers from burning residue if we can compensate. So some of these things uh, have not actually happened but they need to happen so that the farmers are motivated to adopt better agricultural practices. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to combine two questions that were asked. One is about how technology um, can be um, included in the processes you mentioned, or whether it could be, I guess I'll add a bit more about um, what is focused, but basically about Maybe we could look into the future and how this could be linked to technology and innovations. That's from Nippon. And there is also a question where um, Ashan is asking how youth engagement could be connected to the processes that you presented. You mentioned public-private partnerships and you mentioned about how the farmers and the private sector is working together. Could we look at all youth innovation and technology together to move things forward on this? I think private uh, sector, that is industry and uh, government, uh, public sector, they should work together. Uh, when I said farmers do not have um, seeding drill, seeding equipment, uh, um, obviously industry uh, can be a very important factor in designing and selling uh, that equipment to the farmers and making sure the equipment is functional. Government can also join into that partnership. Uh, for example, government could provide uh, rental facilities. Uh, very good success story in North India is a combined harvester. Uh, farmers who are small landholder, five acre, 10 acre, they cannot afford a combine, but now there are companies that rent combine for harvesting wheat and rice and so forth. And uh, they go, uh, the wheat harvest, for example, begins uh, in March in uh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, but it begins in uh, end of April in Punjab. So they keep moving north, uh, this combine owner company, and they charge farmers. I think a similar kind of partnership between government, uh, private sector, farmers, and researcher is needed to uh, facilitate adoption of regenerative conservation agriculture, where equipment required can be rented to them, is provided by the company and government can extend uh, the loan and maintenance facility uh, and charge farmers uh, for those services. Uh, hopefully uh, this can be done and that will lead to facilitate uh, uh, improved about. The other part is uh, education of farmers. I, under no circumstances, want to indicate that farmers are illiterate. Uh, farmers are very knowledgeable from the traditional knowledge that they have, that they, they know. Uh, but still, they may not be familiar with some of the modern concept of carbon sequestration, uh, how it can be uh, have a more longer residence time in the soil, how can the drips of fertigation be better than flood irrigation could be. So those kind of modern concept, uh, education awareness is very extension. Uh, and that extension services can help uh, also promote. But industry partnership with government and uh, with researchers uh, to support farmers uh, is very critical, uh, very important, very much needed. Thank you, Professor Lal, uh, for all the information you shared and everything was very insightful. We learned a lot from you. Um, we are about to come to the close of our session. 
uh, before we wrap up, would you like to add anything as closing remarks? No, thank you for uh, inviting me. I think uh, this is much appreciated. And uh, if I can be of uh, any uh, service to farming community in uh, Sri Lanka, which uh, who are willing to adopt, uh, staying at 10,000 miles away, I can't do very much other than talk to them. Um, but I can certainly provide uh, some information to NGOs like yourself, foundations, uh, as well as work with the uh, universities. Uh, we would welcome when the weather conditions, uh, the current weather of COVID-19, uh, if some scientists want to come work with us, they have to have their own funding from somewhere. Um, there are fundings available from FAO, uh, from international organization, uh, from maybe your own government, uh, from World Bank, uh, from Rotary Club, I had many people come from different funding agency. Um, we would welcome you. And uh, then you go back and do your own research and we maintain link with you. Working together is always helpful. So keep in touch with us. We are here to work with you. Thank you, Professor Lal. Just to add, we do work in <laughs> Asia and Africa both. So I think our colleagues in Africa would find some of the information or most of the information, or all the information that you shared very interesting. Um, we have a few questions, but we'll get in touch with you over email. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining. Okay. And a big thank you to Professor Alec again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.